Good morning and welcome to LUMC's weekly worship service. We're so happy to have you join us this morning as we continue our series, God on Film. Today, Pastor Brandon is going to be drawing from the movie Elemental and talking about how, just like the elements in the movie, there are certain things in our relationship with God that simply don't mix. But before that, we're going to begin our service with some music. Join me and let's sing together. Now, before we get into the rest of our service, I'd like to share with you a few announcements. 
Right now, take a look at that button on the right that says Connection Card. Go ahead and click that button and fill one out, even if you filled one out before. The Connection Card is a great resource. It's a way to register your attendance and let us know that you're here with us today. It's also a great way to take next steps and sign up for activities in the church. And most importantly, it's a way to share your prayer requests with us. Every Monday, Pastor Brandon prays over all of the prayer requests we get and will reach out to you to let you know that he's prayed for you. So please, take a moment right now to fill that out. Now, after you've done that, go ahead and click that link that says Give Online. Every week, our church is blessed to be able to change lives through our online ministry, just like this worship service, and through our work in the community. Now, that impact is made possible through your gifts, so thank you for giving. And if you'd like to continue to support the work of LUMC, click that link and you'll see a variety of ways that you can give. Now, for this week's message, Pastor Brandon is going to be drawing from the movie Elemental and talking about how, just like the elements in the movie, there are certain things in our relationship with God that simply don't mix. Let's watch. Okay, so today we're continuing our summer sermon series, God on Film, where we draw themes from some of the summer's biggest hits and see how they connect to our faith. And this week, we're gonna be looking at the new Pixar movie, Elemental. So to kick things off, let's check out the trailer. Meet the residents of Element City. Air usually has their head in the clouds. Oh, my new jacket. Earth can be a little seedy. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing weird going on here. Uh, just a little pruning. Water is always getting into something. Fire? As ordered. We run a little hot. <laughs> this shop is dream of our family. Someday it'll all be yours. But we all live by one simple rule. Elements cannot mix. <laughs> the pipe squished me all out of shape. Dang. <laughs> That's better. Oh. So you've never left Firetown? Sorry, buddy. Elements don't mix. Whoa. Hey! Plus, my dad would boil you alive. Why does anyone get to tell you what you can do in your life? Come on! Why do they even have these? Eh, who knows. Watch this! Whoa! Ember, I see a change in you. Her guy, you live here? It's my mom's place. We got two kids that are swimming around here somewhere. Marco, follow! What? <laughs> I've been trying to fill my father's shoes, but I never once asked what I wanted to do. Try this! Mm. Dad, those are too hot. I love hot food. <laughs> Okay, so you heard them say one of the key themes in this movie is that elements don't mix, which is something we recognize in other areas of our lives as well, right? Some things just don't mix, right? Like fire and water or peanut butter and tuna fish, parenting and sleeping, right? Some things just don't go together. But here's the thing, right? What about when it comes to our faith? Are there certain things that don't mix when it comes to our relationship with Jesus? I mean. Some things are obvious, right? Like being a Christian doesn't mix with things like murder or adultery or hatred. But what about this one? Money. Because I think that this is a place where most people have no idea what to believe, right? Can you be rich and be a Christian? I mean, what does the Bible even say about this? And the truth is, right, even that can be kind of confusing, right? Because in one place, Jesus says, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. But woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. 
But then in another, we see that Jesus has rich friends. Israelite kings were rich. So which is it? Right? Is it okay to have money or isn't it? Are the pastors right who tell you that if you don't live in poverty, you can't be saved? Or, or are the ones right who say things like God is making you rich, right? Like this guy. You get a plane, and you get a plane, and you get a plane, right? Well, the interesting thing about all of this is that Jesus actually talks directly on this subject, right? There's a lot of topics that Jesus doesn't have one thing to say about, and we just kind of have to try to put the pieces together. But not money. Right? Jesus talks about money once every six verses. And let me show you one prominent moment. Jesus is in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, right? He's given the Beatitudes. He's talked about prayer and fasting. He's described the kingdom of God. And now he's shifting his focus to money. Now, one important thing to remember here is that all of these topics aren't isolated, right? Jesus' Sermon on the Mount isn't this smattering of random teachings. He is a continuous message. And in every one of these sections, right, whether Jesus is talking about fasting or the poor or even money, all of it is about one thing. How do people experience the kingdom of God? Jesus' big message is that he is bringing God's kingdom to earth, right? A world in which evil and injustice are removed and God reigns everywhere, where things are put back to the way that God intended them to be before sin came into the world. And everything in this sermon is describing how that kingdom comes about and who is part of it. And so with that in mind, let's see what Jesus says about money and riches in the midst of all of that. Let's see what he says. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 to 20, Jesus says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. In other words, Jesus is giving the age-old teaching of you can't take it with you, right? It's not that he who dies with the most toys wins. It's that he who dies with the most toys still dies and spent a whole lot of money on toys. But Jesus is also driving us to ask a much bigger question here, right? Jesus is prompting us to ask ourselves the question, how do I define rich, right? How do I define rich? I mean, I think the natural assumption when we talk about riches is money, right? But, but is that really the only way to define it? I mean, the only way that God defines it is God's desire for you to have lots of money in the bank and possessions in your home. I mean, that just doesn't seem to connect with what Jesus is saying here. Jesus is saying that it's pointless to store up all kinds of things on earth that will eventually fade away. So focus on the treasures that really matter. And I mean, let's be honest, right? We all know that it's possible to be rich without having much money at all. I mean, let me ask you, how do you define being rich? Is it seven figures in your bank account? Is it a six-figure salary? Is it a car in your driveway, a certain car or a neighborhood that you live in? Or for you, is rich having a family that loves one another? Or kids who grow up to love Jesus? Or a life that makes a difference, right? Or the sense that God is with you, whatever you might face. I mean, we all want to be rich, but before that, we need to figure out what rich even means. And what Jesus is about to show us is what he valued, right? What was considered true wealth and riches at his time in the Jewish community in which he lived. And look at what he says. In the next verse, Jesus says, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, then your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness... How great is that darkness? Now, if we're really paying attention as we read this, these verses probably feel kind of weird and out of place, right? Jesus is saying, you can't take it with you. And then the next thing we know, he's talking about light coming out of our eyes or into our eyes. I mean, it just, it feels like we've jumped from the theology of wealth to the creation of some sort of superhero, right? Like, but that's because the translators of the New Testament are having a hard time telling us what this really means. Right? You've probably heard me say before that translating ideas from different cultures is really hard. And one of the hardest things to translate is idioms, right? You know, things like break a leg or hold your horses or by the skin of your teeth. Right? These are things that wouldn't make any sense if you tried to understand them literally. And that's what's happening here. Jesus isn't talking about eye health, right? He's not thinking about cataracts or glaucoma. Right, or that moment that I ate blazing hot wings and then decided to take my contacts out, right? He's not talking about that. 
At the time of Jesus, these phrases were idioms, right? To have a good eye meant that you were generous. And to have a bad eye meant that you were greedy. So what Jesus is saying here is that if you have a good eye, if you're generous, your whole life will be full of light, full of God's goodness. But if you're greedy, if you have a bad eye, you will live in darkness. And ultimately what Jesus is pushing us to ask here is another important question, which is, why do I want to be rich? Right? Why do I want to be rich? Jesus is warning us that before we figure out if God wants us to be rich, we need to figure out why we want to be rich. Right? What are our motives? Is it just for personal gain? Is it because we think it'll make us happy? Is it so that we can buy things that we believe will satisfy us? Is it for comfort and security? Because Jesus warns us that money will always vie for our hearts. Money will always be a temptation that pulls us away from God. We will look to it, right? We'll look to it to make us happy instead of looking to God for our joy. We'll look to money for our security instead of putting our faith in God. We'll, we'll make our decisions based on financial reasons rather than spiritual reasons. We'll always be forced to choose. Are we going to serve God or money? Because we can't do both. So before we answer the question, does God want us to be rich? We have to figure out why we even want to be rich. Right? We need to check our motives and we need to think about the spiritual implications. Which leads us to our final verse of this passage where Jesus says this. He says, No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. And with this, Jesus is challenging us with our final question, which is, who is your Savior and who is your Lord? Right? That's what ultimately this is really all about. Are we going to put our trust in money? Are we going to use money to serve our needs, right? Let money guide our decisions. Or is Jesus our Lord and Savior? Is Jesus the one that we look to for our salvation? The one we believe will provide for our every need? The one we look to when things get hard? Is Jesus the one we serve, right? Does he determine our priorities, our path, our, our purpose in life? And here's the thing, right? We're making decisions like this all of the time in our lives, right? For example, we have a really powerful tool in our house, this guy, right? I mean, it's, it's amazing what this guy can do. Kids acting crazy, push a few buttons on this, and the next thing you know, they're sitting on the couch totally silent, right? Or maybe you've had a bad day, push a few buttons, and you're laughing again. Or how about this one? Push a few buttons that take you to YouTube, and you're in for a good 20 minute nap, guaranteed. But this remote can also do awful things, right? It can lead to things that can harm kids or, or even us, right? It can be a distraction that keeps us from our wives or our husbands. It can be a gateway to sin. Every time we pick this up, we have a choice and a responsibility. Sure, it can lead to great things, but it can also be consuming, right? It can be a crutch that saves us from having to deal with our kids. It can be a distraction that we invest more time into than we do our marriages. It can be an addiction that we allow more of our lives than we do God. Instead of investing in our families and the relationships that really matter, we begin to look to this to bring us satisfaction, to provide us with joy and pleasure, to handle our responsibilities, to have a role in our lives that it's not meant to have. And that's the same choice we're making with money. Right? What role does money have in our lives? Is it a tool that can be used for good, or are we relying on it to solve our problems, right? To bring us joy and satisfaction. And ask yourself, am I letting it take the role of being my savior, of being the place where I put my trust, the thing that I serve and work for most? Because in the end, that's not the role it's meant to have, right? Those roles belong to Jesus. And so let me ask you, how are you handling this responsibility that God's given you? How are you making sure that money is just a tool and not something more? How are you ensuring that Jesus is always first, that he determines what truly matters in your life? Because in the end, I don't think God cares as much about whether you're rich or not. What seems to matter most to God in scripture is your heart. Right? Where is your heart? And this is where I really think the definition we've been using for discipleship can be helpful. Because it's hard to know when something is becoming Lord in our lives, right? It's hard to tell if we're relying on something else to be our savior. But our description of a disciple that we've been using, right, our, our follow acronym, well, that helps to make it clear. In fact, there are two particular aspects of discipleship that I think are especially helpful in this lesson. 
right? The first is that first letter L in the follow acronym. L means looks for opportunities to serve. A disciple is someone who looks for every opportunity to bless others with what God has given them. And so here's my challenge for you. Write out what you're rich in and how you can share it. Right? Maybe it's money or time or knowledge. Make a list and take some time to appreciate where and how you've been blessed. And then think about how you can share that. Right? God told Abraham that our purpose is to be a blessing. How can you be a blessing? How can you bless others with your time, with your knowledge, with your financial resources? Right? The other gifts God has given you. And then also focus on the next aspect, right? Because a, a disciple is also someone who, oh, offers everything they have to Jesus. I mean, here's the crazy thing about Jesus, right? People always talk about how Jesus made the law easier. But Jesus really didn't do that. I mean, he removed the requirements that had been added to the law. Things like how many steps you could take on the Sabbath and things like that, right? Or, or other things that were added that actually kept people away from God. But beyond those things, when you look at it, Jesus really took the requirements and he took them to a whole new level. Right? He says, when someone tells you to walk a mile, go two. When they ask for your shirt, give them your tunic. Don't forgive seven times, forgive 77 times. I mean, he pushes us to strive to always love and serve more. And he does the same thing with our possessions, right? He doesn't just ask us for 10%. He asks us for all of us. I mean, the question had always been how much, right? How much do we give to God? How much do we have to do? But he flips that whole thing upside down and he challenges us to ask not how much must I do, but how much more can I do? Not, not how much do I have to give, but how much can I give? Not how little, but how much. And so my other challenge for you this week is to take a look at the things that you've listed above, right? The resources God's given you, time, money, knowledge, whatever it might be. And take that list and wrestle with things like, how much can I give? Where can I go beyond? How, what more can I do? What, what more can I offer? I mean, Jesus is promising the kingdom of God. And if living a generous life is the key to the kingdom of God, if this is what gives us those good eyes, then there's never enough, right? We will always want more of that. And the more we offer, the more we'll experience. And to so ask yourself, how much more can I give? Right on your connection card, you'll see a space to write these things in. What are you gonna give, right? Write that down. Whatever you write in there, I'm gonna be praying for you this week. And so take a moment to fill that in. And while you do, let me pray for you. God, we just thank you for the incredible blessings that you've placed in our lives. And I know we might measure those things differently. And we might look around and we might see people who seem like they have so much more than us. But God, help us to just be present, be thankful, be aware of all the unique ways that you're blessing us in our lives. And help us to share those riches with others whether we are rich in love or rich in time, rich in wisdom and understanding, rich in the spiritual gifts that you've given us, or even rich in money, would help us to use those to be a blessing. Not to just bless ourselves and bless those who matter to us, but to be a blessing to your kingdom, to have good eyes that allow us to be filled with light. It would help us to experience your kingdom to love it, enjoy it, and savor it so much that the other stuff doesn't matter. That we will give all that we can because we want more of you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Stay.
Well, that's it for our service today. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. If you haven't already done so, please take a moment to check out those links to the side and down below. Fill out a connection card, sign up for a group, and give online. We're so glad that you decided to be with us today, and we'd like to personally invite you back next week as we kick off a brand new series called The Wilderness where Pastor Brandon will be taking us through some of the early books of the Bible and showing us how the relationship those early believers had with God is so critical to understanding our own relationship with God. Today we're going to end with one of our special benediction songs, so let's join together and sing. <laughs>